this talk is entitled, All the Encouragement You Need and More. How many of you need encouragement <laughs> and more? <laughs> you will have it by the end of the talk if you have set yourself aside and left your worldly life out in the world and let something new and fresh and eager listen to the talk today. Eagerness is a power in itself when it's directed rightly. You should be rightly excited every time you come into this room because you have that opportunity to leave your old life in back view with all its pains. Now, Encouragement, inspiration, can be very clearly classified into three different sections, and we're going to discuss all three of them. One, one of them is all wrong, the other two are all right. False encouragement, that's the first classification. And in very brief explanation of false encouragement, and I want you to recognize it when I describe it to you. False encouragement is any word or example you hear which urges you to use this world for self-fulfillment. And that's, that's all the world can offer you. The world screams out, get ambitious, get married, go somewhere and do something, become, become someone recognized by the world as someone who's accomplished something special. Now, you should have already recognized a few examples in your own life what false encouragement is. Because you get it and have obtained it, from everyone, and you know what kind of people they were who gave you that encouragement? They are discouraged people. That's false inspiration, false guidance, false example. When you see or hear anything that tells you to use what you can see with your eyes and hear with your ears, to use those in order to quell the noise inside of you, they will not succeed, therefore you have been betrayed. You have not been encouraged at all. Noise, noise is bad, inner noise, you know that the clashing of your own emotions. Din is sin, din is sin. All right, the real encouragement starts with a mind operating clearly, correctly, and helpfully in this world. And I'm simply saying it is right encouragement when the teacher encourages the student to get that lesson. Right encouragement based on education, on facts. We live, we live in a world of facts here on this earth, and the facts that tell you how to do the lesson or drive your car better. Anything that enables you to perform your worldly daily tasks, necessary tasks, that's right encouragement. I think you understand that. You were encouraged as a child by your parents to learn how to dress yourself when you're young, how to persist in maybe your employment wasn't going too well and your father or mother told you to do this or do that in order to improve it. That's fine. All right, we are now going into the third section, which is the supreme encouragement and hope and inspiration of all, the highest of all, because it comes down and works through your mind to provide ordinary daily encouragement. We're talking about spiritual encouragement. The, the supreme method and power by which 
you are given for the present time to all of you through your intellect, given right instructions, given facts. During the course of this one talk today, you will be given dozens of encouraging facts. And I will explain now that point a little clearer. In your present stage of trying, of working, and of taking the voyage to the other land on the other side of the ocean, you do need encouragement. It's proper, good, it's necessary. And you, you must only be where there is right encouragement, not false, because everyone else is feeding you a line. Everyone is telling you how to, how to succeed, and all the failures are telling you how to be a success. Because that's the only level of success they understand, is to try to impress someone with your vocabulary, with how well you can cook a dinner. Does the word petty come to your mind when I say that? It should. All right, you are now getting proper encouragement and inspiration and guidance right now while you're hearing this talk. The time will come when you no longer need to be encouraged at all. Your mind has the facts, but that's not spirituality. You're told, if I work hard, if I'm willing to break away from my old nature, then I will lose the problems connected with that old nature. That's right. Isn't that good? Isn't that encouraging? You don't live it, though, do you? You don't feel it. Right encouragement starts with heaven, comes down to earth to keep you confirmed in what you know, but only know intellectually. You, you know thousands of things about spiritual development. But they're pretty shaky, aren't they? One minute you, th you think a thought, a right thought, and you feel as if you've got it made, and the next day, you, next day you do something utterly foolish, and you get discouraged. God has gracefully provided a counterattack to the dark forces that want to discourage you and get you off the path. And that is by telling you how to keep right thoughts, which are not, not spiritual powers, but mental powers, how to keep the right thoughts in place. Finally, please don't think it's going to happen tomorrow or next month. Finally, the very, this is, this is, this is tremendous. Now, don't go into imagination on this. Just simply take the fact that I'm giving you. And don't think that it has anything to do with you at present, because it hasn't. Because you, you, if you believe that, you'll be discouraged finally, because you'll see the contradiction in what you thought about yourself and the failure that you experience. All right. The time will come if you allow yourself to be encouraged by being in the right place. The time will come when you won't need any encouragement at all. Reality doesn't need to be encouraged, and that's what you're living in. How about the word doubt? Uh, how easily are you dismayed? Huh? Very easily. How easily are you, your, your, tr your train is zooming down the tracks 100 miles an hour. They have Trains are faster than that now, by the way. That's your science for the morning. <laughs> your train is going down the trap 100 miles an hour, and oh, I'm really getting places. I guess I'll be able to take over the class next week. <laughs> <laughs> and it falls off the track, and you wonder what happened. Now, because you are weak, you spiritual kindergarten, discouraging thoughts, examples, beliefs from other people can enter you and knock your train off the track. When you 
are stronger than any adverse suggestion. Oh, I better, I have to stop with that one. The, the littlest suggestion that the, the white clashes with red in your clothing and you feel disgraced. Now you get your right example of that. You didn't do some little thing according to someone else's idea of how to do it and you feel crushed, unworthy, as if you don't belong in this world and you'd like to, you'd like to hide out. All right. I've made it quite clear that you're very shaky and have no permanent confidence in yourself, but which you can have. When you're real, when I said when you're real, you don't need encouragement on how to be real. You've got it. You know it. You not only know it, but you know you know it. You know nobody can touch you anywhere. All right, once more, so that you can understand permanent spiritual confidence better, think of how little you have of it. How would you like to exchange what you are this morning with what truth can let you have? You would like that, wouldn't you? Now, one of your big problems is that you think too small. There is, there is such a thing as right, powerful thinking. But you're timid. I better not step out of line or everybody will notice that I'm out of line and they'll think I'm an oddball. How have you ever thought that? <laughs> How you were worried it was true? You know the, the story of the soldiers in line, and the one who was out of step said, everybody's out of step but me. Right. You're afraid to step aside from your petty little world and enter a big one. You're afraid to ask big questions. You're afraid to ask them because you know that you don't presently have the capacity to receive the answer. You ask them anyway. Now, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you getting utterly dissatisfied with your tiny, cramped, miserable little world. I tell you verily, if you don't get tired of it, you're not going to get rid of it. You're going to have to live in burning dissatisfaction with it when you could have broken way out. I'm going to give you a, a grammatical suggestion and an, a great inspiration. There's such a thing in grammar called a superlative. How many know what a superlative is? A superlative is an extreme example of something that is virtuous or great or glowing. And you use a superlative to describe it. Oh, it's a glorious sunset. It's a marvelous attitude to take. It's a magnificent way to live. Superlatives, exaggerated, so to speak, words which indicate that something is above the usual, above the average. I tell you, and I tell you right now, there are no superlatives, superlative enough to describe what you are on the way toward discovering. But you can start by using the words. You can understand by saying that's a, a, a grand and glorious lesson that we had that one day. It is glorious because 
because by comparison with what we get in this world, it is certainly something way above it. And I describe that as being a petty little world when nothing is magnificent, nothing is great. So, the greatest superlative in the English language or any other language and the greatest and only encouragement you will ever discover is based in one superlative, which is the word truth. Now, you know what to do when you feel shaken and dismayed and confused. How many of you are confused? How many of you are more than confused? What's an unsuperlative word? <laughs> Wan I mean, wander around in a daze and in the nights too. <laughs> if you're out on the boat in the ocean and the boat tips over in a storm and another boat comes along and throws you a rope to haul you back to safety, all you need is that one rope. You don't need 50. You need the one rescuing, res rescuing rope that has tossed you. Why don't you, right now, and this is now, instead of a question, I have changed it to an instruction, realize that the only way for you to stay encouraged is to think, associate with, desire, read here, only things that are truth. Now, isn't that going to eliminate all the false ropes that won't work? Aren't you going to recognize from now on that everyone gives you encouragement one, which I explained at the start of the talk, that's all they can give you and that's the last thing you want. You have to be perceptive, far more than you are. I want you to all to wake up right now. Oh, wake up, come on. All you're doing is thinking. I want you to think, but I also want you to see. I want you to understand. I want you to, I want you, I'm gonna give you an encouragement now. I want you to try to understand what I mean when I tell you to get yourself out of that chair and let something higher than yourself sit there and pay attention to what's going on. Here's a little story we'll go into. Here's a, a little dove, and he accidentally finds himself s swimming and flying along with, a, with ducks. But uh, I don't know what he called it. What do you call it? A bunch of ducks? <laughs> I have invented a new description for the family of ducks. Bunch of ducks. If it's good enough for me, it should be good enough for you. <laughs> and this little dove didn't, aha, he didn't know he was a little dove. He looked around and saw the ducks and thought he was one of them. Now you know what he had to do. Thinking he was a duck, he now had to prove it. Oh, he did just what you do. He stood off at a little distance and watched how the ducks went about their business and then tried to imitate them and, and even repeated some of the exact phrases that the ducks used, some of the quack, quackeries there. <laughs> oh, now can you see already that we have a, a downcast little dough on our hands? That's you. Do you ever think of yourself as a little dove? <laughs> All right. So he, he watch as they waddle. <laughs> now, a dove doesn't waddle, he walks, I think. But he tried to waddle as he's more like a duck, and even he knew it was ridiculous. 
but he didn't know what else to do. Listen, that, that's very important for you to realize. He didn't know what else to do. And he heard them quack. Now, doves, everybody knows a dove coos. He didn't know that. It wasn't natural to him to coo because he had lost his naturalness already, and so he tried to quack like a duck. Again, ridiculous. He saw the ducks go down the water of the lake and paddle around. He got down and got out one foot and sunk. <laughs> Drippingly climbed to the bank and flapped himself dry again. And now, now what do we have? A depressed, <laughs> a depressed, discouraged, sad-eyed little dove. Pretty pathetic picture, huh? Oh, I'm looking around this room. <laughs> oh, yes. That was just the beginning of his troubles because because he had the wrong identity. He didn't, did not know him. he was a dove. He tried to imitate a duck. I know you're following this, but I want you to go out and experiment with it and see where you're trying to quack when you could coo. You want to practice cooing? <laughs> oh, now came one of the worst, most devastating experiences in quackland for a little lost dove. He wanted them to like him. He wanted to be one of the gang, one of the ducky gang, which wasn't so ducky for him. So he tried to join them. He thought, he, see, you, you really believe you belong in misery land. You do. Well, of course you believe it. You think it because that's where you are. For you, misery land is the only land that exists. See, but you don't know, you don't realize that that's illogical. You don't realize it because you have said, there is one world and I've got it. If there's another world, I'd know about it. You can know about it, but not as long as you say, I've got the exclusive world. Exclusive world, and you can summarize it all as my world, me. I'm the center of my world. The ducks rejected him, ignored him. No, no matter how many times he went over and fawned and smiled and tried to, tried to be one of the gang, they just wouldn't have anything to do with him. How many of you feel rejected by the whole world? You know, just to think about that a little bit. The reason you rejected is because you want to be accepted. If you don't want to be accepted, you can no longer be rejected. See how simple it is? But why do you want to be accepted? You want others to like you. In order to prove, and here's a, the way to say the next thought, in order to prove that you're not wrong about your identity. But you can't do that, because when you're wrong about your identity, it's false, and that's all there is to it. Now, all the little dog would have to do to realize that he had somehow fallen into the wrong place, just as all humans must realize they've fallen into the wrong place. Oh, now, now you could understand better why God promises you a faithful promise, guarantees you relief from strain, guarantees you a very quiet life with no worries of any kind. Because he has first promised you his shining, glowing, superlative nature. There's hope yet. We're not going to leave our little dove stranded out there. Oh, I, I, I like to tell you this, and I'm going to do something I like to do, is to tell you this again. Think of your age. 
And I want you to get it specific. Like you're 44 years, three months, <laughs> six days, 14 hours, and 29 seconds old. Got it? Those of you with a lightning like mine, <laughs> a computer like mine, stop before another second passes. This means you're going to understand that you, the little dove, how did it happen? Never mind how it happened. Just, just know that you were put into the duckyard and believe that you belong there. And settling for the crumbs of life in the duckyard. Quacker, cheese and quackers. <laughs> <laughs> No more. You're going to increase, double, triple, your spiritual suspicion that a false nature of yours is trying to prove to you that it's a true nature. The evidence that you're a little dove in the duckyard is so evident, it is incredible that you haven't seen it. Now listen, now you listen to me. You are not your father. You're not your mother. Your aunts and your cousins whom you reckon by the dozens. You are a human being who was put onto this earth to discover that you're not a duck. You're a duck. And every single method, encouragement, inspiration, every single map you need is available to you any time you want it. And what I want you to do in this supreme book of wisdom is for the next several days, read the chapter that says you're a dove, not a duck. That means that you don't have to be accepted by anyone. You don't have to join any group. You don't have to be liked or what you call loved by anyone. This is God's word for it. This is the truth. You really, in a higher essence, you don't need any encouragement at all if you could see it. Now you do. I understand that. And you're given encouragement. But I'll go back to a point I gave earlier. When you're on top of the mountain, actually living there, you don't need encouragement for climbing up the mountain. You're already there. While you're coming up, yes, someone must tell you that's all right. You never mind those big blocks of granite in the way. You just go around them. If you slip and fall down, just, just get up again. That's good. That's, that's nice. You're missing something. You... I'm going to use the word again. You have a petty little mind with petty little aims. And let me tell you what your petty little aim is. This is awful. This is terrible. This is discouraging. What you want every morning is to be able to get through the day with as little pain as possible. To avoid your enemies as much as possible and not get hurt. That's not worthy of you. Don't allow anything to take you away from the fact that there's the, another world for you. The longer you stand, the more you allow spiritual inspiration to come out, come down, and fight the remaining whatever 
temptations or evils come into your mind and try to take you away from your mental foundation that there is another world. Only God can save you. And he starts with the mind because you don't have anything but a mind. And even that's all confused. God has given you this morning the facts that you're a dove, not a duck. You're to remember that and catch yourself imitating ducks by being fearful, by quacking and blabbing. And you are to refuse it on the spot. What will happen is your spiritual wings will spread naturally and you will know your dove. And when you know your dove, that is your a spiritual nature, spiritual entity. When you know that, you fly away. You will, you will wonder as you fly away how you could ever have stayed there so long in Duckland, where everything was so terrible, where everything was so scary. You're not scared anymore because the true nature is never scared. It doesn't. It doesn't even need encouragement. I told you, it is. Your real nature is the whole nature, and it's pure, and it's superlative. It is marvelous, it is glorious, and it's all for you. There is a very strange tormentor of the spirits of human beings who has a specialty. This adverse force specializes in keeping going inside a man or woman a certain thought, attitude, idea, which is extremely painful. This extremely painful thought which human beings have, and I want you to see it in yourself, this tormenting thought that the individual has and suffers from is that he has no clearly defined course in life. He has no plan, no easily defined place to go and things to do. There is nothing definite for him to work with in order to arrive at a definite destination. It's like a man in the ocean in a little boat and he's out in the ocean, no land in sight. And he doesn't know which way to go in order to reach land. He can look out in any direction he wants, but nothing is clear. Another way to say this is that deep down, human beings don't have a course, a direction, which they feel will give them a definite reward for their action, whatever the action is, whatever the course is. Now, you have this. Everybody has that. And it is so deeply planted and so persistent. The tormentor is so diligent in his devilish work that the individual gets frantic over its very presence. And it is such a feeling of despair and hopelessness that he wants to get the struggle over with. 
He doesn't want to feel without direction, without purpose. He doesn't want to live another day with this vague feeling of meaninglessness. He wants to get it over with. He wants to settle things. What I'm telling you will have to be brought up by each one of you to the surface of consciousness so that what I'm telling you with words will be known by you from your own knowledge. Young man, 16 years old, lived in the United States. His father was a businessman who traveled all around the globe conducting his business. And he took his son with him on summer vacations and other times when the boy wasn't going to school. Father and son got on boats and airplanes and traveled all over the world. And the boy learned his father's business. He was going to take over the company eventually. So the boy helped his father. But at the same time, they also enjoyed the wonders and sights of the countries they, they visited. And among other places they went, besides Europe and Australia and wherever, they went to South America. And in one of the towns there, the father had a branch office set up. So they had to go to this town in South America every few months. And the boy went with his father. And this particular town was one for tourists from all over the world. And one of the attractions of this tourist town was that it was alongside a huge river, one of the tributaries to the Amazon. And one of the you know, attractions to tourists was a, a boat ride up the river. So this young man went with his father on the tourist boat ride, which took several hours long wandering course over the river and into other little rivers and finally back again. One or two stops along the way at native villages. So this fascinated the boy more than any of the other attractions. Just just appealed to him to go into the unknown jungles and he heard stories about lost cities and buried treasure. And it fascinated him as a young boy with an adventurous mind. And he took the tour, the boat ride cruise so many times that he remembered it quite clearly. The boat took a left turn after about an hour after leaving the town and went in a straight course and stopped at a village. He knew the course very well, imprinted on his mind. Many years passed. The boy grew up and was more and more active in the business and he began taking the trips on his own now. So here he is now in his 40s after all this time of learning about the cruise. Came on back to the town and decided oh, it'd be nice to take the trip again. It's been so long, 20 years. Sure enough, boat was still there. Still took passengers and tourists on a long, long cruise. A big round circle of the river and up and down and sideways and finally ended up back at the original starting point, the town. So he got on the boat one morning, all excited over seeing the same sights he'd seen before. He was all alone, so he had plenty of time to think about what he wanted to think about. Boat started off, 100 passengers and the, and the crew. He was all excited. Boat started off and then, ah, the familiar came back. In his mind, he was saying, let's see, the first thing that happens, the boat tours are pretty much a straight course, then it makes a slight bend, the river takes a bend to the right. Beyond that is a small village and the boat stops there briefly and the passengers get off and buy tourist uh, mementos. Tour went on for the first half and he was interested in what he saw. And then after leaving one of the villages, he was standing on the deck, just kind of relaxing and enjoying himself. And uh, a feeling came along that interrupted his enjoyment, both of the memories of there when he was with his father 
and also in, interrupted his enjoyment of the cruise itself, it seemed the wild animals along the bank and the natives waving at him and he waved back at them. Something interrupted his pleasure, but he didn't know what it was. Some alien thought was jumping into his mind and it wouldn't go away. He wanted it to, but it wouldn't. So he kept watching it. Watching the thought, and he's wondering what it's all about. Why should it be disturbed when he's having a good time? He's on a little vacation cruise of several hours and be back at the town at, mid at uh, night. He kept thinking about it until finally he understood what it was all about. And he found out what it was all about by watching the bank of the river. He's leaning against the railing, looking out. And it finally struck him why he was disturbed. This wasn't the course. I hope you're applying this spiritually. This isn't the right course. He knew the right, he'd been on it dozens of times before. And he knew it couldn't change, it don't change a river. A little bit maybe, but not much. And there are several other rivers where they could have gone wrong. And he got to thinking that somewhere along the course, the crew had put the boat into the wrong stream. But he, he didn't, <laughs> please listen to this. He couldn't make himself believe that the crew of the captain of the boat and half a dozen crewmen, they're all in uniform, look very spick and span, very authoritative, and they know what to do. Listen to me, you listen to me. He couldn't believe those authorities could make a mistake. I mean, they're, they're supposed to have the knowledge of the boat and the rivers and the crews, and it's supposed to be a safe voyage. How could they make a mistake? So he tried to push, I, he couldn't push it out of his mind, and don't you push it out of your mind. I know, I know you're getting this. I know it's sinking down. So he, he, knew, he finally knew he had to do something about it. He knew that that boat had actually taken the wrong course. And if they kept it up, all sorts of bad things could happen. The boat could run aground. If a storm came up, they might even get carried way out into the jungle. Some, in any case, a disaster was looming, and they see persuaded them to stop the boat from going into the wrong direction. So he didn't want to question the authorities. You don't want to question authorities, do you? You're afraid they might be wrong. And then you'll have to think for yourself. You'll have to make a decision for yourself, right? Yes, yes. Uh, his pulse increased a little bit, but he, but he said, I don't, I don't care if my pulse does beat faster. I don't care if I can get a little, little hot in the forehead. I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to do what I know is right. No question in my mind. I've been on, I, I, know the, I know the voyage as a boy. I used to make little charts and maps. I know it exactly, and I know they've gone wrong. I know I'm right. And I'm not going to be a coward by just sitting there and letting the disaster go on. So he went up to the crew, and he found out that they were new. They were inexperienced. Well, let's see if you can relate to this. He tried to explain to them, Captain, sir, and crew, you've taken a long turn. You took it about four miles back, and you didn't know it. The two rivers look pretty much alike in all the little branches. Uh, I, I want to tell you, gentlemen, that you've made an error, and you, the boat is being led to oblivion out in the jungle. And he said it very politely, very kindly. He wasn't angry, courteous, but firm. He wanted to explain to him the mistake they made. Well, he could tell by their facial reactions 
that they weren't interested in hearing it. He, he could tell that the, the hanging on to their egotism, the preservation of their sense of rightness, of being right and not wrong, he could tell that that, that was what was important to them. Ooh, uh, hang on to your chairs or something. I, I, how, 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 could, how could any human being do that? The, the lives of the passengers are at stake. Their, all, their own lives are at stake and they prefer their sickness. That's the world. They told him, they, they came back with, you know, that oily politeness in return you see in people when they want to calm you down and tell you that they know what's right. He knew they were wrong. They didn't know they were wrong. They didn't, didn't want to admit it. So they politely dismissed him. Sir, we have to get along with the running of this boat. <laughs> well, he knew there was no hope for them. And there wasn't, as you will eventually see. No hope for them. Do you know do you know that the course you take determines what happens to you? Of course, of course, the course of death. You'd, you'd, better, you'd better examine the choice you may have made. You'd, you'd better be willing to sacrifice your sick egotism in favor of finding eternal life. You, you, you had better be willing to give up the thrill you have over saying you're right when you're really wrong. You, you think that saying it is a true thrill. No. Now he gave up on the crew. The captain only wanted to walk around the deck in his bright, shiny uniform and his cap, being the authority, assuring everyone that it was just a nice voice. So I couldn't do anything with the crew, so he went to the passengers. Told them the same thing, got them aside. And he told them, I tried talking to the authorities, they won't, they won't listen, but maybe you will. And he talked to the elderly man, he talked to the young woman, talked to the recently honeymooning couple, talked to people from Iowa and Florida and Oregon. Told them the facts that, sir, this boat is on the voyage to ruination, to lostness. And I'm trying to tell you that so that you get off. You see, sirs, I know where I've been even in the wrong places in the past. I even know where the boat will stop at a certain place where you can all get off. You get off and I'll show you how to, we'll all get back to civilization. I know, I know how to do it. Because I've been in the wrong places in this jungle river as well as the right places. And when I went and saw myself in the wrong place, I knew I was in the wrong place, so I knew how to get to the right place. I admitted that I was lost. It happened what happened thousands of times. So what I'm telling trying to tell you is that if you listen to me, we'll all get off at the next stop where there's a place we can a sandbar we can get off and we can work our way back. They said no. You know what they did? They said see if, are you putting this all together? You're working hard. You know what they did? Instead of thanking him and saying, yeah, we'll get off and we'll all, all go back. So I can't thank you enough, sir. You, I, I, the captain, he doesn't want to hear, but, but you, sir, you, you decide to stand all alone and tell us, thank you so much. We'll, we'll always be grateful for you saying this. They did not do that. You know what they did? They went to the captain and complained that that man was bothering them. That man was... That man is trying to destroy their pleasure of the voyage. You know what the captain did? Came over and told him to shut up. Don't you talk. Don't you disturb those passengers anymore. Don't you tell them that they're in danger. I'm the captain of this boat and don't you forget it. Got it? Following? Sure. I know, I know, I know you do. But I want you to get it higher 
brighter, stronger. What do you do? You know what you do? You go to the railing and you look for that sandbar down there, and when it comes along, you jump off. Uh, how many of you have left the world yet? How many of you are getting closer and closer to jumping off? You know, you know the symbolism of that. It, truth will tell you. It will tell you to get off. It will tell you to watch. And you'll see the bar. I, I, I want the sandbar to come in view for you rather sooner than later, like this morning. Where, where you're willing to get back to where you can choose afresh and this time make the right choice. You know what happened, don't you, uh, to the rest of the story. I'll tell you what happened. The boat continued. He jumped off. He got back to safety. The boat continued. Oh, I better add something to that. As it went deeper and deeper into its lostness, and the storm started coming up, as every passenger sensed their doom, guess what they did? All the loving passengers began to hate each other. And they hated the captain and crew, and the crew and the captain hated them. They all become scrambling like mad dogs around the deck. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? That man who remained true and jumped off the boat. Let me tell you something. You, please, oh, if you ever let anything sink in, let this sink in. When he jumped off and got to shore and saw the path back to town again, when he got there, let me tell you something that he didn't do. He didn't give one gl backward glance at that boat as it disappeared into the thicket of the jungle. Not one backward glance. I'll tell you something else. Not one tear of sympathy of sorrow. No, you can't do that. That's sick sentimentality. When you jump off the boat, you, you don't have to pretend that you love people anymore. You don't have to fake it anymore. Look, look. It's, it's a matter of simply seeing that they have made their choice. They could have made another choice. You can, you can start making another choice yourself right during this talk. But this particular point is a very interesting one. And, and it's one that, that is going to rob you of so many things that you think are valuable. Let, let the talk, let the truth rob you of your false sense of wealth. And here it is again. Those people scrambling around, maddened by the fact that they knew they were on the doom boat. That's the way they always were, even when the boat itself was in calmer waters. You, oh, you, see, you didn't know that. Look, look. If you're angry at noon, that anger was in you at 11 o'clock. You weren't mad or raging at someone or something because you were getting ready to fix your lunch and your, your mind was distracted at the shrimp soup you're going to have. <laughs> we'll heard of shrimp soup. <laughs> All right, we'll have a new dish. Serve it in your cafes. <laughs> you don't, oh no, my friends are nice. Why do you have to say that? You want to believe because you're weak. That's why you, you need friends. You need friends. <laughs> you don't need them at all. You need God. If you if you have God, you don't need any any of those people at all. Therefore, you you won't have any false sympathy for them. Are you are you going to sit there and tell me you feel you feel sorry 
for the very people who wanted to toss you overboard when you tried to correct them. Correct them. I'm not. I'm not saying you go into anger and hatred toward them. All that is wrong because that would be part of the kingdom of evil itself. I'm saying there's a certain freedom, and I, t I will assure you that you will know what I'm talking about when you get off that boat. You will know with absolute perfection the clear, right spiritual attitude and the clear, right words and actions to have toward, to have toward those who have rejected God in favor of darkness, of the adverse forces. You will know exactly how to behave toward them. And 99% of that, of that behavior is to avoid them at every opportunity. When I gave you that illustration of the people who were now paying for their own folly, including the captain and crew, the authorities. When I, when I told you that story, there was a faint little whispering in you as to the validity of it. Because, I'll put this in the form of a question, because do you know nice people who occasionally explode and you see a bad people in there? That hides most of the time, you know that? How about yourself? See, you need have no connection with evil, with stupidity, including the people, including the people who chose to perish. You need have no harmful attitudes toward them. You can be free of them. And just as that one middle-aged now, now middle-aged businessman, just as he was free physically of their folly, because he made himself be free of them physically by leaping off the boat, just as he was free of them physically, you can be free psychologically, spiritually, inwardly of all bad people, which means they can't hurt you anymore. Hurt exists only in the jungle, in the wrong course in the jungle. You get off. What have you to do with them anymore and the storms anymore, which they have chosen for themselves? Now let's see. You will choose from this talk, you will choose one outstanding idea, the strongest impression that you have had during this talk. You will write it down on a piece of paper. Make it clear intellectually first of all. That's good. Then you will go over and over it in the next few days and you will allow all the sub-points, the other points in the talk, to come up and connect with the main point, which will happen if we do that. Think about it, and especially think about the fact that you can get your choice back. You've lost it now. You've surrendered to authorities. <coughs> You've surrendered to wrongness, to pride, and to vanity. Understand you can get your choice back, but get the main impression down on a piece of paper and let and let the truth of it grow in size and in influence. Truth can influence you too, of course. Let it influence you rightly. Do that so that the talk will come back to you and the force and the power of it and the healing power of it will come back to you in future days. Once you really realize that your journey in life has been in vain, it will never again be in vain. Aren't you going to think about that first statement for a long time? Let's try it again. When and if I realize that my way of life, my journey, has been really useless 
It will never be useless again. Aren't you going to spend all day and night long understanding that so that you will not feel futile toward everything you do, which is the way you feel now. You want, you want to get paid for what you do, and you do get paid. You get paid with the depression and the feeling of uselessness that you have. You are always paid by yourself, to yourself, according to your actual nature. What's your actual nature? You know, you know very well what it is. You feel, you feel futile about the whole thing. When you're driving your car, you have a destination, and you're sailing along the highway with great confidence that it won't be long before you reach where you want to be. You're sailing along, but you were told at the start of the trip, the journey, that at a certain point, 20 minutes along, you'd see a bridge on one side of the road, and you'd see a historical monument 10 miles further. So you keep your eyes open for the markers. Make sure you're on the right place, going in the right direction. Remember, I'm talking about your life right now. This illustration is your journey through life. So you drive and you drive and you drive and you're looking for the bridge and you're looking for the historical monument there and you don't see them. And it's long past, oh, it's long past the time when you, you thought you should see them to be reassured that you're on the right road. Oh, you were, you were told somewhere by someone or something that if you do certain things, you would be happy. You'd see the markers to indicate that you're on the right road. You'd better stop driving. You'd better find out that the promises others gave you and that you took for yourself, those promises have not been fulfilled, have they? Come on, just, just look, very simple. Say, that's right, that's right. What I expected to find, I have not seen. I have not experienced. I was told that I could take command of my own life in the right way by taking command of my inner life. I was told that, but I don't have that. I was, I was told that there's a way to get rid of the ache. The ache has always been there. It's, the ache is there right now as I'm seated in this room. What I'm urging you to do is to know that it's, it's about five hours, 20 years, past the point where you could have seen the markers to indicate that you're on the right road. You haven't seen them, so you must be on the wrong road. Have you ever done that? You've done that personally, haven't you? You know that you're supposed to see a certain sign that all was well and you didn't see it driving the car, act, driving an actual car, you begin to sense the little doubts in your mind and you wonder what you should do. And you know what you said? I'll tell you what you said. Well, another five miles and I'll stop and ask someone. After five miles, well, another five, right? This is very, listen, listen to me. This is extremely serious that you realize the serious position you're in by not having the intelligence to simply say, I don't know where I'm going. I might, as well, I might as well admit it right now. That means you pull your psychological car off to the side and you ask someone. See, you're driving mechanically now. Oh, I'll tell you who's in control of that car, not your real nature. Who is in control is a trumped-up nature, an invented personality that always says, I am never wrong about anything, I'm always right about everything, and that is what is taking charge, and you don't see that. You don't see how glued you are. 
to your own egotism. Oh yes, I, oh, I better tell you this. I better, I better make something clear that's been gnawing at you all the time. You know, if you started out at one o'clock in the afternoon to reach that destination, and you're supposed to be there in an, in an hour, start off at one, supposed to be there at, at two o'clock. I better tell you that it's five o'clock in the afternoon. All the time past two o'clock, when you could have arrived in Woodley, where you, your heart wants to be, all the time past two o'clock has been wasted and useless, and it's time you stop. That's three hours wasted. How about translating that in terms of your own personal life as a man or woman here on earth? Wasted years. Now that I've said that, I will tell you that, again, remember the opening statement about the journey, once you realize that it's futile, it will no longer be futile again. By a miracle of the heaven's grace, of supreme beauty, at five o'clock, after you've wasted three hours on the highway, wasted 30, 40 years of your life, at five o'clock, if you pull over and want to know personally whether you've made a mistake or not, and when you find out that you have, you have indeed made a mistake, you're not going to ever waste another second. This is what I'm urging you to do. When you're driving an automobile, there's a thing called momentum, right? Big heavy chunk of steel, when it's going 55 miles down the highway, you apply the brakes. It's not going to stop all at once. There's too much force going. But you put on the brakes, finally you can pull over to the side. What I'm saying is, you have to understand the momentum of your own personal faults, will, and ways. Understand that it is not going to surrender easily to your initial wish to pull over and see that you've made the wrong move so that you can correct it. It's not, it's not going to do it for you. It's going to oppose you, as a matter of fact, which is why you need every possible explanation you can get as to how you can overcome you. Now I'm going to tell you a story which is a very nice little explanation of, of why you have not pulled over to the side of the road. A little further explanation. Once upon a time, there was a botanist. And as you know, a botanist is one who deals in bots. <laughs> this scientist had a special assignment, which was as follows. He was to open up his big greenhouse you know, a greenhouse with all the glass on the outside so the sun can come in. Open a big experimental greenhouse. And the purpose was to develop plants, trees, bushes, flowers, whatever, that could be sturdy and hardy in adverse weather conditions. In other words, plants, rice, wheat, corn, anything that could stand out in the rain and the erosion and not fall down. In other words, that would be good for farmers, be good for consumers, for the beauty of the landscape to find sturdy plants. Because a lot of them are weak. Oh, did they, you've seen the tumbleweeds. Isn't that a good illustration of human life? Tumbleweed, have you seen it? Big, bushy, right? And underneath a little tiny connection with the earth and it breaks off there and they tumble around for the rest of their life, bumping into other tumbleweeds. And you know what that means. So he got the big greenhouse all ready and put all the equipment necessary. And he set one corner off for, let's say, for growing berries, all kinds of berries, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries. Again, the purpose was to develop berries that could 
grow profusely, abundantly out outside outside the greenhouse, out in the this stormy, awful world, awful as far as weather is concerned. So I began experimenting. You put uh, a dozen strawberry plants here, a dozen boysenberry plants there. I kept an eye on them, tended them, gave them all the scientific care that he knew about. And over a period of weeks, he began to notice something. What he noticed, get the spiritual application of this, what he noticed that one of the berry plants in just a short period of time, a few weeks, had already grown to twice the size of all the rest. Oh, he got excited. He could just see the level. He looked over, there's the rest of the, most of them were just a foot off the ground and the others were, the one was high above it. He took a special interest in that one and gave, and gave it special care. Yeah, do you want special care from heaven? Then you have to, you have to have the initiative to want to know how to grow higher than your neighbors and your friends. He got more interested and excited over the fact that this one had double the strength of the others. Time came when he picked it up, trans, transplanted it, that's the word, transplanted it from inside the greenhouse to the outside. Kept an eye on it. Oh, this is, this is the test. See, I'll have to stop the story to define that. If you want to no longer be a stunted human being, stunted berry plant, then you have to allow the full force of nature to start to develop you. It's allowing. Your mission is submission, submission to the laws of heaven, of laws of plant life in the case of the illustration. You submit to that and you will start to grow. And when you have this positive experience of growth above who you used to be and maybe a little above your neighbors because you're interested in going, there comes a counterforce. That counterforce occurs in the illustration where you're put outside and all the adverse and hostile forces of nature come down on the plant, the uh, heavy winds and the erosion heavy rain, snow, cold, and heat. The one chance that transplanted berry plant has out, outside the greenhouse is to remain firm in the soil, representing truth, right? If it stays there, there is nothing adverse that can hurt it. So this plant did it. And listen to this. See, you're limited. Uh, oh, you're all in the greenhouse. You're inside the greenhouse. <laughs> you're in the greenhouse envying other people, wondering if you can grow higher than the next one, but we'll get to that point a little bit later. All the time, so concerned with yourself, your fault self, that you can't have any concern for natural growth. Even in the greenhouse, one should grow a little bit limited by the walls and by the roof of the greenhouse itself. When you're outside, there's no limit to your growth. This, this thought itself is marvelous for you to contemplate the fact that I can have unlimited inner growth that is developing understanding of myself and all of life, understanding God, understanding the opposite of satanic forces. I can have, I can have all the understanding I want if I allow myself to grow a little bit enough to be put out there. Now, submission is your mission. Submission to what? Well, now that's not quite as simple as it sounds. Submission to what? Well, the answer is submission to high heavenly forces. Submission to them. But you don't know, well, believe me, you don't know anything about high heavenly force. How can you submit to something you don't even know what you're thinking about or what you're talking about? There is a way. Submission to heaven means awareness of hell. 
And you will get aware of the hell inside of you by starting the path, by getting outside, by growing up. Do you, do you know what those plants, those berry plants and all the rest of them are doing inside the greenhouse? You know what they spend their whole time doing? Considering them human beings. They're lying to each other, competing with each other, hoping that you can be more valuable than the, the next plant. They're living in a, in a state of dangerous infantilism. They think, they think that the greenhouse is the whole world. I tell you, that's what they think. They think it's everything, and I better get it while I'm in here, because there's no place else to make it. Have you translated that rightly into the life that you live? Everybody, everybody is a walking greenhouse. Hostile, worried, worried that they won't make it, and you know, when, you're, when you've taken the stand, a human being has taken the stand that this is it. Look how protected I am. He says he sees the, the plants, the infantile plants, see the four walls and the roof. I'm protected. I'm protected against storms and rain. There must be, there must be, here's, here's where the religious lie comes in. There must be a great power that loves me because I, I'm here and I'm safe and the lightning is outside. The lightning isn't here. Oh, I'm so, I'm so grateful that I'm a plant of the great heavenly gardener. I'm so glad that I'm here to hear protect. Now, sooner or later, if you stay in the greenhouse, if you stay on the highway without checking your position, absolutely without fail, the law of degeneration sets in and operates. Sometime this afternoon, if you have the chance, look uh, outside, or you're walking down the street, take a look at a degenerating plant, a bush in someone's front yard, maybe your own yard. T take a look and, and notice the signs of degeneration, of how it's, of how it's losing, of how it's losing its life. Oh, you know, the green is not green, it's yellow. And the stems that were once firm and upward pointed are now sagging and dragging on the ground. You know lifelessness when you see it in a plant. And I want you to see it equally in your whole, whole own life and the life of the whole world, too. You have one chance. That one chance is to, is to recognize that to sit inside the greenhouse and claim that that's the right place to be, your one chance is to see how, how you've kidded yourself. The law of life is spiritual growth. That's the law. Have you obeyed it or disobeyed it? You're not supposed to remain mentally and emotionally now as an adult the way you were when you were 10 years old. You're supposed to be different. You're supposed to recognize the fact that you're no longer a little kid. And you can't feel the protection of mama and papa and whoever. You can't feel that protection anymore. You're supposed to learn how to be on your own. Who are you depending on? Who are you afraid of losing? You know what I'm getting at. That's a sign that you'd rather stay inside and pretend that you're protected and pretend that you're growing. That greenhouse has four billion plants in it. It's pretty big. Four billion plants, practically every one of them lying to each other telling each other, isn't it nice in here? Isn't it fine? We have the protection of, of God. We grow together. We're close together. An angry mob, a, a red-faced angry mob is, is close together in their evil. You ever notice how uncomfortable, uncomfortable you feel 
being wrongly close to another person in an elevator or whatever. You don't like it, do you? Can you? This is what the plants are doing, saying that this closeness is love, closeness is good. Oh, there's something in you that says that's a lie. You know what, you, you know what your heart wants. Whew, you can hardly wait to get rid of those get rid of those plants that have been lying to you and that you lied to. You want to get out of there. Why don't you get out of there right now? I urge you to. You've had a little bit of growth. You've got a lot of, oh, you've got a lot of facts. Unfortunately, the facts give you an identity at this point. That is, you say, you say, I am growing. See, you've got all the fa spiritual facts. Come careful on this please you've been given a lot of truths a lot of exercises and you say I am growing how can you say you're growing when the worry of yesterday is your same worry today and it's going to be the same worry tomorrow growth is loss a loss of your belief in yourself you believe you're on the right road doesn't change the fact any to believe you're on the wrong on the right road when you're on the wrong road you're on the wrong road saying I'm on the right road your knowledge of that then your knowledge of the, the fact that that you have allowed yourself to be lied to by the great dominating liar the storms on the outside you have allowed yourself to believe what is against your true interests. Now you have true interests. Your true interests are the little plant who's, who's eager for just one thing, to get out of there and get outside. Do not pretend that it's all in here. Growth outside comes as you don't brag about the little bit of growth that you've had. The first thing you find out when you get out of the greenhouse is how miserable you always were inside the greenhouse. How weak you were, how full. Oh, I tell you though, that the realization of that is what wants you to do the one thing you must do, which is to dig your roots deeper into the earth, into the, the world That's, that signifies the spiritual world, digger in, deep, deeper into the spiritual world. And then what happens the next day is a bigger storm than the one before, and a bigger one, and a bigger one, and a bigger one. Now, you have to realize that the new storms are there for you to use. Now get this, get this somewhere in your notepad, in your mind, in your spirit. Now I'll make it easy on you. True words. True words. You underline them, put a big red circle around it, look at it every day, never forget it because the dark forces want you to forget it. And I don't want you to forget. I don't want you to forget. No exceptions. No exceptions. The trials, I don't care what it is. Let's see, what would it concern your health? Would it concern some particular worry you have, something unexpected? Would it concern some security, in quote mark, that you had in the greenhouse, some security, and now that seems to be shaken? No exceptions has one meaning. No exceptions. Why do you say that one trial, oh, I didn't think that marriage or romance would break up. I didn't, I didn't ever think that I'd get in trouble down at work. I didn't think the past recollections would ever bother me that much. That much. Now you listen to me. Who is making that exception and saying this is the one thing I can't overcome. This is the one thing that got me too much and I, why don't I give up? I'm asking you a question, who's saying that? Marvelous revelation. You are saying it. Defeat is saying it. Fear is saying it. An imposter personality is saying it. 
A lie is saying it. Don't you allow it to thrive inside your mind anymore. Quote, is anything too hard for God? Nothing is too hard for God. Everything is hard. In fact, it's a matter of fact. Everything is impossible for you. You can't do anything, and you never will. But you can select the doer. That is, you can select the actions from heaven to work in your behalf. I've told you, and I'll repeat to you, think of yourself as a chooser. You can choose to grow even when you're in the greenhouse as a young person, as a child even. You, you can choose to remain true to that very faint and yet audible, that very faint truth in you. You can be true to the little bit of truth that you sense. How nice to know that your mission is submission, submission to the will of God, to the purpose of God, the purpose of God for your existence here on earth. Do you, the question, do you, really, do you really want to go out of here, really want to go out of here on the right road toward inner wholeness and toward an authentic spiritual life? You really want that? Now, careful of your answer, because the you doesn't want anything to do with that. But I want you to find the little one rare, unique part of you that agrees with the talk you've heard today, then it agrees with universal health and truth. I want, you to, I want you to be aware of it talking to you and helping you and guiding you and giving you strength. I want you to disally your, ally yourself with your neurotic mind, with your habits, with your boasts, with your positions. I want you to take yourself away from there and ally yourself with God. Do that. The growth will occur all by itself because God is the author of growth. He's the only... You don't make yourself grow. You allow yourself to grow. Oh, what a different kind of a bush or plant or tree you will see yourself becoming. God is purity. God is graciousness. God is pleasantness. God is everything that your heart wants. Allow yourself to grow into what God wants you to be, and you'll find that that is what you wanted to be all along.